the recording. Letting Ike know we can begin to broadcast. Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Case number 20-7081, Robert Weissman and Patrick D. Llewellyn, a balance versus National Railroad Passenger Corporation doing business as Amtrak. Mr. Joshi for the balance, Ms. Amundsen for the Evelyn. Couple of excedrin. Good morning, Council. Council for Appellant, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. You may have pleased the court. I'm Nandan Joshi for Plaintiffs Patrick, uh, Patrick Llewellyn and Robert Weissman. With the court's permission, I would like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Plaintiffs are Washington, D.C. residents who use Amtrak's rail service for business travel. They filed this action to obtain rail tickets that would allow them to use Amtrak without entering into an arbitration agreement that Amtrak has made a mandatory term and condition of providing rail service. The Council, legal dis Council, can I ask a question at the outset? I was a little puzzled. Before we get to standing, what is your merits claim? Uh, the merits claim is basically, uh, there's a statutory ultra virus claim and constitutional claim, but the, the core of the claim is that as a, as a component of the federal government, Amtrak cannot condition access to its services on a waiver of constitutional rights. So it's an unconstitutional conditions. Uh, that, that, would, that would assume there's a waiver. Yes, the, that would assume that the arbitration agreement operates as a waiver of plaintiff's rights to go to, uh, to seek, go to court in, it, rather than to non-binding private arbitration, I mean, to if binding they, private arbitration. If that was not so, if, the, if there was no waiver uh, of your right to challenge a arbitration, should it come up, then uh, what, ha what, what consequence is that, if you're wrong on that? So if we're wrong on that, we, lose, we, should, we would lose on the merits, but the court below did not obviously did not reach the merits because um, uh, the court believed that, uh, the district court believed that being required to enter into this contract, which is the arbitration agreement, is not itself a, a, a concrete harm. Um, You're not taking the position that the arbitration provision is per se illegal, are you? No, uh, uh, we do not take the position, for example, that the government cannot enter into arbitration agreements. Our theory is that um, our claim is that the government cannot condition access to rail service or any other service, for example, social security benefits or veterans uh, benefits on waiver of a waiver of constitutional rights. Why do you, I'm puzzled. Why is there a waiver? I don't get it. I don't see how buying the ticket constitutes a waiver. Uh, I'm really mystified. I don't see any reason why you couldn't challenge the arbitration process if you ever got into that situation? Well, the arbitration here agreement here is set up under the Federal Arbitration Act. So that means arbitration is a matter of consent. If plaintiffs want to ride Amtrak, they have no choice but to give their consent to this arbitration agreement. It's not an optional feature they can choose or refuse and still ride Amtrak. So, But, it, it, but if it was illegal, uh, you could certainly challenge it at the time it was imposed on you when you when you had a claim? Well, as we note in our brief, it's a little uncertain. I mean, arbit the Federal Arbitration Act was not, I think, enacted with the contemplation that the government would use it against individuals, against the public. So it, it is a little uncertain whether we would be able to challenge it later if once, if the plaintiffs were to give their consent. But of it's course, not counsel, counsel, we have to assume the merits, that you would be successful on the merits in order to test the threshold question of standing. Am I right about that? No, that's absolutely correct. Uh, and that's the problem with the district court's standing analysis. If, if, if the court were to affirm the district court, the plaintiffs would be forced to make the choice they, are, they filed this lawsuit not to make, which is, do I ride Amtrak or do they ride Amtrak or do they for, and, and consent, give their consent to this arbitration regime, or do they avoid Amtrak altogether? 
All right. Well, tell me why. Why is that a forced choice? Maybe you can sort of step back and take us through your argument about standing and the injury that you think is occurring in this case. Sure. Well, it's a forced choice because they don't have a option. I mean, like, like I mentioned, Amtrak cannot impose arbitration on the plaintiffs unless the plaintiffs consent. The plaintiffs do not have the option of refusing consent and still taking Amtrak. So Amtrak, if they, if they are adamant that they will never sign on to the arbitration agreement, their only choices for inter, interstate, uh, intercity business travel is to take some other mode of transportation. And All so right. it, it- But you're sort of framing it in a way that is different from how we ordinarily think about these things. So let me, can I step back and kind of ask you, um, what is your client's interest, concrete interest, in riding a train that does not have a ticket attached to a mandatory arbitration provision? Do they have an interest in that that is something we've recognized? Well, you, you have recognized uh, over the over decades, uh, consumers have an interest in products and services. For example, the Consumer and Consumer Federation of America had an interest in purchasing internet access service on terms that the consumer would have liked. The, the Chamber of Commerce in Chamber of Commerce versus SEC had an interest in purchasing mutual funds. Um, All right, but state, state your interest in the same way. It's an, in, it's an interest in acquiring a product on my own terms. We said that. Yes, yes. I mean, that was essentially Orangeburg versus FERC. Uh, the, the municipality there could acquire uh, wholesale electricity, that wasn't an issue, but the municipality wanted better terms that they thought they were entitled, that it th- thought it was entitled well, to. Well, the council in Orangeburg, it really reduced down, although it's, it sounds complicated, it really reduced down to the proposition that a uh, South Carolina company would have to pay more for power from the North Carolina company. So it was, it, clear economic injury. So that's correct. And what we have here is it's not a price economic injury, but it is a cost onto the planet. So for example, if they want to travel to New York on Amtrak before the arbitration condition, they would say pay $100 for a ticket. Now they have to pay $100 plus waive a right, which is the right to go to court. But that, but, if, but we, that, if we were to conclude that there's no merit to the proposition, there's a waiver. That that a per, that the tick because uh, my colleague is absolutely right. We have to clearly assume the merits before we decide the standing. But the Supreme Court has said if the st- merits are so weak, you could actually d- decide that too right at the outset, as an exception to steel company. Now, so if we conclude there's no merit at all to the proposition that uh, your client waives his right to challenge the arbitration agreement in the event there is a circumstance where it is imposed on him. Uh, it, what, what, then, what then happens to your standing? So I think there, there are two issues there. One is what the district court decided, which is that there's no concrete harm at all. The second question, which was not an issue and has no, not I'm been I'm not litigated. talking about standing now. I'm talking about the merits. If we, if we conclude there's no merit to the proposition that your client waived his right, but just by taking the ticket, to challenge a, a mandatory arbitration at the time an issue arose, if we said there's no merit to that, then what's the consequence for standing? So, I, if, if, well, if you conclude there's no merit to it, then that's a merits decision. If you conclude that the merits are, I don't, I don't agree with this, but if you conclude the merits are so frivolous that... You're, that, you're, that that's right. You recognize that you, we can yeah. decide that on the, based on the Supreme Court. And you were a little fuzzy about uh, the notion that there's a waiver here just by buying the ticket. And I, for the life of me, couldn't understand why there's a waiver. If I bought the ticket and subsequently I, there was a dispute between uh, the railroad and me and the railroad insisted on going to arbitration, 
I, I couldn't imagine why I couldn't challenge that at that point on the ground that it was in an illegal clause. Well, it's, it, it, well, it, it's certainly uncertain. We think it's uncertain whether that would hold up at, at a later date. First, once plaintiffs consent to the ticket, they can't challenge the fact that they made the arbitration. That, that's they can't, a, that's they a, can't, a, they can't, they can't challenge, they can challenge, they can challenge the, the, the grounds that the arbitration agreement is illegal. Right, but under the severability principle that the Supreme Court's announced, the plans can only challenge the four corners of the arbitration agreement separate from the rest of the uh, contract. Now, does that mean the plaintiffs can challenge the condition? Uh, so I'm not, I'm not sure. Certainly Amtrak has put in no cases that suggest that's a viable challenge in response to our explanation of why Section 2 of the FAA and the severability principle and the delegation clause really impose hurdles on the plaintiff's ability to challenge the arbitration. I see your point, the point, but the key to your whole case is that you're forced to waive the right to challenge just by buying the ticket, you're waiving the right to challenge the arbitration provisions in the future. If we thought that was without any merit at all, what does that do to your standing? So I, I think that's slightly, the waiver is the waiver of the right that they possess right now to go to court. That's what we contend is protected by the constitution. So what the arbitration agreement does is force them to agree in advance that they will not, they will, they will sell their dispute in some other way. Okay, so, can, counsel, I'm sorry, can I, can I just jump in because I know that you're sort of the core of the dispute is overstanding given what the district court held. And so what I'm trying to understand is the suggestion that you've made that there is some kind of a tangible or concrete, concrete cost anytime one's preferred conditions are not offered or don't exist. And I'm trying to test that. So what if, what if rather than the arbitration provision, the plaintiffs would like to ride Amtrak trains with blue armrests rather than red armrests. And Amtrak does not have any blue armrested trains. And the plaintiffs say, I am being forced to ride in a car with an armrest that is not my preferred color. Do they have a concrete injury? Because it's a cost, I suppose, to have to do that when they don't wanna do that. But is that your argument? So I think that the, I think, well, it is a potentially an injury uh, that Congress can elevate into a concrete harm. The cases say an injury itself is not sufficient. Um, if, if it's not legally cognizable. Um, and so if, if, if it's a situation like that where the specific um, interest being um, it put forward it does not have a legally cognizable basis, then so what, is, not what is the legally cognizable basis for suggesting that having to buy this ticket with an arbitration provision is, in it is an injury? What well, it's a, it's a contract. It's a binding contract on the plaintiffs. It's a purely economic matter. It, it, it is a cost on them. They have they used to have a right that they no longer, if, if the contract is enforced, would no longer have. And so, I mean, I don't, I don't think anything is this far removed from a situation of like an aesthetic injury, like the armrest example uh, that you gave. I mean, this is this essentially is reduces the value of the ticket to them because now- But only in their own minds. It doesn't reduce the value in the sense that they pay more physically in terms of money, right? They're just disappointed. They're sad. Or no, they're afraid of the risk that they might in eventually have to arbitrate. Well, the right? risk of the risk of future uh, having to arbitrate is essentially economic in nature. This is not just a pure question of fear. If, for example, Amtrak offered a second ticket option that said you can pay five dollars more, but if you if you decline your right, uh, if you decline the arbitration agreement, no one would question. I think that five dollars is an economic injury. The fact that they only offer one option to plaintiffs, which is take it or leave it, um, accept this contract term, or or don't ride our our trains. Uh, is just as much of an economic injury to plaintiffs. In, in but does it, has, does it have to do with the nature of the term? Because it seems to me that every consumer agreement 
it can be reduced to a contract. So it's really not substantively different because the contract, you know, so fine, Amtrak puts in its contract, you have to accept that we have red arm armrests. And the person says, but I don't want that, right? So is it the fact that you're saying it's arbitration in the contract that is creating the harm? Well, certainly I think this is the easy case as it, as it was in Orangeburg in that it is a, the terms of a contract. That has that has a that has a value to well you're, you're you're focusing on the la language in that case of what term involving term the use of the word term but in fact the holding in this case is that uh, Orangeburg was going to have to pay more money yes so no, that's correct. So, you, so you you can't uh, leverage that as as my colleague is pointing out to, to any term anywhere let me give another hypothetical Suppose Amtrak in its ticket states that if you go into the quiet car and you use a telephone, you will lose your right to travel Amtrak for three months. Can uh, you challenge that on the grounds that that's an unfair term? I would think so. That seems like a free speech challenge. You, they're restricting um, your speech. speech, speech you might you, 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 have a, you have a you have a right to talk in the quiet car. Well, whether you have a right or not is a merits question. But I think uh, the standing there is pretty pretty apparent. So you well, would uh, have stand, because, you would have standing. Wait, you you wait, injured. Just, Hold on. Sorry. Can't have two questions at once. Excuse okay, me. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Judge Silverman. Look, the point is. Is it not that we wouldn't know at this point whether, uh, let's suppose the term had said, you would lose your right to uh, travel on Amtrak for th uh, three months unless you had adequate excuse for speaking. Uh, you could Is your view that you could challenge that now? Or would the question be, what would have happened if uh, there was a determination subsequently that uh, either there was or was not good reason to speak as an emergency? So I, 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 I think if the plaintiff had put in a declaration that says they intend to speak and they are have a legitimate fear that Amtrak would enforce this against them, that does sound like the merits would be a First Amendment question, but the, the standing is the violation of the constitutional right. May I make one other point? You, you would agree that ripeness and standing tend to intertwine. Both of you in your briefs recognize that. Sometimes they, 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 the concepts overlap, don't, don't they? Yes. No, we don't, we don't dispute that. We, All right, we, let, we, me, let me go and tell you about, you make a very strong argument that there's no way to distinguish the core of a product from something ancillary, which is what my colleague was pushing, and we, my, me too, uh, with respect to something ancillary. But I call your attention to Abbott Laboratories and toilet goods. And it was, to be sure, a ripeness case, but it was constitutional ripeness, really. And it's, you can treat that as standing as well. And in Abbott Laboratories, the Supreme Court and in uh, toilet goods distinguished between primary conduct and something that was ancillary. You know, toilet goods was inspection regime, uh, whereas Abbott Laboratory was the label on a, on a can. Uh, so the label on a can affected primary conduct. If you use that analogy over in this situation, wouldn't you conclude that the real product here is the transportation on Amtrak. That's the product. And the arbitration is like the toilet goods question of ancillary inspections. So no, I, I would not, I mean, I, I would not uh, consider any term that's mandatory that plaintiffs do not have the right to opt out of as ancillary because that is part of what they are purchasing. Aren't so, all terms, aren't all ter ticket terms mandatory? because you, you're not yes. negotiating all of the conditions that are in the ticket, right? Right, but they don't all rise to a marriage challenge. How do we know? In other words, how do we know which ones give you grounds to claim injury 
when you say, I don't want to do that thing, and which ones don't? So I think the, the way to think about this is because concrete injury is an absolute Article 3 floor, you could think about it in a, in a sense of, is this type of activity something that Congress cannot regulate? Because that is, oh, and grant consumers and, and a cause of action. Because once you, once you declare something a concrete injury, then it's out of Congress's hands. For example, if Congress wanted to bo- uh, prohibit uh, arbitration agreements in employment contracts. If the district court's right, that's, that's an ancillary term. Injured, injured job applicants can't sue unless they enter into the contract and, and uh, have an imminent arbitration proceeding um, you know, in front of them. I guess where, I'm, where I'm, I'm desperately trying to isolate the different factors here. So to me, cause of action and the merits are different than injury for this, from the standpoint of determining whether or not you have an injury in fact for Article Three purposes. You seem to be suggesting in your briefs and in your argument here this morning that you are injured in a concrete way if the desired product that you would like to purchase does not exist, if you or, or is not being offered. That it's enough to say, I want an Amtrak ticket that doesn't have an arbitration agreement or that doesn't, you know, I want to ride an Amtrak that has blue seats, not red seats, whatever it is, you say, if that is not being offered, you're injured from the standpoint of Article 3. And I don't understand that. Sure. And I I, I get your point, Your Honor. So I think standing and injury and the merits are like 99.9% separate, but there is this very sliver of overlap that the cases talk about where the, they recognize the existence of a de facto concrete injury that is legally inadequate unless Congress has elevated that, elevated that injury into um, a, a cognizable injury. And I, I can read you from the Supreme Court's last recent decision in TransUnion, this, this, this last term, Congress may elevate the status of legally cognizable injuries, concrete de facto injuries, if they were previously in a, that were previously inadequate at law. So there is a whole universe. The council, one of the things that I'm finding confusing is you're relying on a line of authority from this court, which talks about injury in the context of action by a federal agency. Here, the Supreme Court has said clearly, Amtrak is not a government agency. Therefore, from my point of view, we're treating Amtrak as a private corporation for purposes of the type of individual claim of injury. Now, Congress has authorized Amtrak and created Amtrak for a specific purpose, but it left details to Amtrak. And the discussion Judge Jackson has been having with you, you seem to resist on the idea that if you don't want the product as it's being offered in the market, that's an injury for purposes of Article Three, And I think what our questions are getting at is we're trying to understand, I suppose, A, how under our authority, you have the type of injury that is required. And B, if you don't, then what authority are you relying on? And I understand your point, giving up the right to go to court is not of the same nature as objecting to the color of arm seats or chairs. But I don't think you persuaded me at this point that either assuming our authority applies in this context, what we have required in defining the product and the cost it seems to me is consistent with what the Supreme Court was talking about in the cases that Judge Silverman was just discussing with you. And I think that 
Judge Jackson was bringing in. And I understand you don't agree, but the question is, how does the court write an opinion consistent with our jurisprudence and the Supreme Court to get you what you want? And I haven't heard that answer yet. And we haven't even talked about imminence. Uh, sure. Well, I, I think one example might be the Chamber of Commerce case. So that was an APA case where the Chamber sued the FCC for their independent director rule that was imposed on mutual funds. And this, the, this court held the Chamber had standing, even though they were not directly regulated, because they could not get access to that product. The reason they have standing because they suffered a concrete de facto injury in the unavailability did you, of that. Uh, did you happen to read the second case involving Chamber of Commerce, which came back again, which Judge Rogers wrote? Uh, did you read that case? Uh, I, I'm aware of one Chamber of Commerce case that was addressed in the briefs. Uh, yes, but then there's a second one. The case came back up to the court and Judge Rogers explained the standing holding in the first case as uh, based on an economic injury that the Chamber of Commerce as the investor uh, was deprived of certain mutual fund possibilities of purchase, particularly small ones, because of the regulation. And as an investor, if you're deprived of the opportunities to invest in mutual funds because of this regulation, you're injured because you want to have a broad range for your portfolio. And indeed, she pointed out also there were direct expenses. So she explained cha Chamber One, uh, I thought, in a brilliant fashion. You shall forgive me. Well, my apologies. Um, I don't think any of the briefs cited that. And I was not. Uh, so I, I, I can't speak to Chamber One. I'm happy to. Chamber, two. Enough, chamber, chamber two, two, excuse me. Yes. Let's um, just assume that our understanding of Chamber One is that it turned on the increased cost. So right. the product was no longer available. All right. And so part of my question is, what is the cost to your client when it doesn't even allege that it potentially has a claim? much less that it has a claim that's definite in the foreseeable future, nor that, as Judge Silverman was exploring with you, that you would be barred from making the constitutional argument you're making now. So um, I think the cost is a purely, um, it's a contractual cost, right? It is a binding agreement. Uh, it, the court, if the court says that individuals can be bound and not have standing, it can be it can be forced to consent to being bound by a contract term and not have standing. That's that's I mean that, that would be the holding of that that would I think if if you were to rule affirm the district court's decision. But there's but, no there's no indication in your briefs or complaints or no indication, no law that you cite for the proposition that by buying the ticket, you've waived your right to contest arbitration and if there was an incident in which there was a dispute. The, the, the waiver is the waiver of the right to go to court. Yeah, Wait, that right exists. Where, where I don't see that. That's what, uh, that's what private arbitration is. You go to private arbitration. Yes, rather than... but if you claim that the arbitration clause is illegal, you could always make that claim in the future. Isn't that right? You, if, said, if... You, you said there's you've waived the right to make that claim by buying the ticket. I think that's absurd. It, it, under the arbitration agreement, at a minimum, if we make that argument, if we're allowed to make the argument, the arbitration agreement is uh, illegal, even considering the severability principle, which doesn't look to the, which only looks to the four corners of the arbitration agreement. Uh, that would still go to the arbitrator under the delegation clause. Because that's not necessarily, not necessarily. If you argued that it was the the arbitration clause was illegal, 
and uh, that you couldn't be concluded, it couldn't be concluded that you waived your right to make the challenge. So I, I think that's almost a frivolous argument. And if it is a frivolous argument, then we can dispose of this as the Supreme Court has advised us without, uh, without us assuming the merits. In other words, my colleague, Judge Jackson, is quite correct. We must always assume the merits when we turn to standing, unless the merits are frivolous. Well, can we, can we talk a little bit about eminence as a sort of separate standalone traditional criteria? So wh why is it that even if you have a protected interest in not being forced to agree to uh, uh, arbitration, arbitration rather than trial, wh why is that an eminent injury in a situation like this where, as Judge Rogers pointed out, there's no indication that your clients have a current claim that could either go to, to, to arbitration or trial. And they would have, you know, such a claim would have to arise and then the uh, Amtrak would have to uh, invoke the provision and then they would perhaps be in a situation in which they would be forced to arbitrate. How could that be eminent in any meaningful way? Well, it's eminent in the sense of um, plaintiffs do not want to give their consent. They have, to, they have to consent before that whole regime even applies to them, and they do not want to do that. Now, if they don't want to do that, then that, that's something they have to make a decision at the so time you're of travel. Saying, you're saying the harm is being forced to give their consent, and it's imminent because they're being forced to give their consent right now. Right. So if the arbitration condition were optional, you buy a ticket, you have this option of, you know, they could reject the arbitration agreement, and then Right, Amtrak, you know, free and clear. They have they have control over their own legal destiny. I just feel like your theory. I, I hear you that this is important because it's arbitration, and that's something that Congress may have elevated or whatnot. But your theory of injury seems to undermine and undo all of the standing limitations, because in every case, <laughs> one could say. We want the state of the world to be different than it is as a result of the person of the defendant's action. And it's different right now. So we have an imminent injury. I don't understand so, so, how any how so there's I, any I, limitation. No, I, I well, I don't think so. I mean, I, I let me give an example, perhaps, of uh, something that I think everyone agrees is an injury, which is higher prices, right? So if, if your gas, the gas price of gas goes up 25 cents. That, that's a concrete injury on, on drivers. They have to pay more for gas. I don't think anyone would disagree yes, with that. But, but can, can, you can't just go into court and say, I prefer lower gas prices, because that's not an injury that is legally cognizable under any federal law. Now, Congress passed a statute that said the price of gas has to be $3, and consumers can sue if it goes higher, or if the consumer says, the price of gas is higher because there's a violation of the antitrust laws. There's a price fixing agreement. That same price increase that wasn't inadequate that was inadequate before now becomes legal, legally cognizable. So here, here's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about your merger of the merits and this issue of injury. The way that you framed this now has an injury in not in case A because the person doesn't have a legally a protected interest, meaning they don't have a claim, right? They couldn't win if they went to, to, to court because there's no cause of action or actual problem with, you know, having gas prices be higher. But in, 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 in world B, they do have an injury because they, their claim is meritorious. And I've yep. never understood those two to be connected in that way, um, such that you can claim an injury because you say, we're so right about the ultimate legal uh, claim that we would like to make. So, uh, yeah, I apologize if I was unclear. The, the, the argument isn't that the plaintiff has an injury if the claim is meritorious. The plaintiff has an injury, um, for, for example, for higher gas, gas prices, if the plaintiff can tie that injury to a legally cognizable, uh, something that, it, you know, it's protected under law or under the Constitution in some way. It's not a huge barrier. But it does pre uh, prevent, you know, uh, plaintiffs from going into court and saying, "I don't like the state of the world," which is the concern you seem you were expressing. But you do have to. You, you, this court will not see those situations too often because any lawyer is going to tie 
an injury to a claim for relief. And so the question of legal cognizability is not almost never gets litigated as far as I've seen. However, um, it, it, it does prevent plaintiffs from um, you know, simply going to court, having standing because they're dissatisfied with the options available in, in the marketplace. But it does let me get, go back it, to if I right. counsel, let me go back to one point. Uh, suppose you, your client did not waive his right to challenge arbitration by buying a ticket. Would you have an injury? The, our, our clients have an injury because of requiring no, 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 just follow my question. Suppose buying the ticket did not constitute a waiver of your right to challenge arbitration should the event arise. Suppose that was true. Do you have an injury? I would say yes. I think it just even being, even even if that isn't a waiver. It, well, if the court concludes no, yes, because the the it's still a contract. He's still they are still signing on the dotted line, and that has some meaning. Unless the court. But, but says, your argument is that's unconstitutional. That's one of your arguments. I think it'd be helpful if we could hear for counsel from for Apple. And then we'll give you some rebuttal time. Thank you, Your Honor. Counsel for Appley. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Jessica Ring Amundsen for Appley Amtrak. Um, Your Honors, for the reasons that you've been discussing, the district court correctly determined that plaintiffs do not have standing to raise their challenge to the arbitration clause. Um, unless and until Amtrak seeks to enforce the arbitration clause against plaintiffs, they simply do not have the actual and imminent injury necessary to satisfy Article 3. Let me follow up, counsel, with this. just what I was asking uh, your colleague, uh, your opponent. Um, would you agree that any person buying a ticket with the arbitration clause would, does not waive his or her right to challenge arbitration at the time it is invoked against them? Your Honor, I would agree. And in fact, that's what every case that is cited in our briefs that has considered this question has held. So the Supreme Court in Monsanto, the Seventh Circuit in Board of Trade versus Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the Fourth Circuit in Jones versus Sears Roebuck, the uh, Ninth Circuit in Lee versus American Express, the Eleventh Circuit in Bowen versus First Family Financial. Every time that plaintiffs have raised this sort of challenge that the inclusion of an arbitration clause violates their rights, the courts have told them you do not have standing or the case is not ripe unless and until the arbitration clause is involved. Well, well, well I'm, I'm asking a specific, uh, a slightly modified question, which is you as the defendant in this case agree with my proposition that petitioners by buying that ticket has not waived their right to challenge the arbitration clause should an incident arise. We do not uh, We do not dispute that they could raise such a challenge. We do not believe such a challenge would be meritorious. That's a, se that's a separate question. Right. In other words, you're not taking the position there's a waiver by buying the ticket. No, Your Honor, they can certainly, anyone who wants to challenge an arbitration clause at any point as unconscionable or illegal can file a suit at that time. So here we have the unusual situation that the plaintiff in this case is asserting that by signing, by buying the ticket, he or she has waived his right to challenge the arbitration process should it arise. And yet the opponent says that's not true. We're not we wouldn't claim that there's a waiver. So doesn't the case just go away? Well, Your Honor, to be clear- not, That's really a question, not for you, but that's more of a question for the other side. Right, so- But it's really important to note this, that the Amtrak has said, we do not take the position, we would never take the position that simply by buying the ticket, the uh, passenger waives his or her right to challenge the arbitration at the time that it's imposed. Well, Your Honor. Let me just clarify something here. Let me play devil's advocate. 
I understand what you're saying in response to Judge Silverman's question, but I'm a little skeptical, as I think is appellant, appellants, that when, if ever, Amtrak invokes the arbitration clause against a claim that one of the appellants has against Amtrak, Amtrak will defend in part on the ground that you consented because you entered into this contract with us at the time you bought the ticket and you understood that if you wanted to ride our trains, then any claim that you might have now or in the future in some way linked to that transportation that you bought with that ticket would be subject to mandatory arbitration by a single arbitrator under the FAA. Would that Honor. be Amtrak's first line of defense? Yes, Your Honor, you're correct. And that's what I was going to clarify. In Yes, in so how could you respond to Judge Silverman's question the way you did? However, Your Honor, what I'm saying is that what every case has held is that for purposes of standing, unless and until the arbitration clause is invoked against the plaintiff, that person does not have any actual or imminent injury. There is well, a, it's an no, imminent, that's, that's what that's, that's, those cases uh, were focusing on. There's no imminent injury. That's right, Your Honor, because there's at most, as the cases have held, a, a someday, maybe hypothetical chance that the arbitration clause is ever going to be invoked against plaintiffs. So, for example, plaintiffs with respect to imminence have not even alleged that they have uh, any sort of concrete plans to travel on Amtrak, let alone that they will develop a dispute with Amtrak, let alone that that dispute would then, uh, that Amtrak would then invoke the arbitration clause against them. Excuse me, counsel. I, I want to just follow up on Judge Rogers' question because it's a very good question. Uh, isn't, I recognize that if there was a dispute down the line, uh, Amtrak would argue the arbitration clause binds the plaintiff. That's perfectly legitimate. That's different from my question, which was, would you take the position that they waived their right to challenge the arbitration clause just by buying the ticket? In other words, if they went into... If they went into court at that time saying the arbitration clause is unconstitutional, it is a statutorily violate, violation, X, Y, Z, it's in his fattening, whatever claims they make, you would not take the position that they waived their right to make a constitutional claim or a statutory claim by buying the ticket, would you? No, but we would likely claim that 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 belonged in arbitration. That that right, of course you would. You, you, of the, course you would. Right. But yeah, all. But their injury now is assertion that we would waive that claim just by buying the ticket. And I thought you correctly said no. They wouldn't waive it. They could raise it later. They can raise it later. And as Judge Rogers pointed out, we would defend against that by saying, no, this properly belongs in arbitration and you agreed to an arbitration clause. However, they have not waived their right. And that's 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 exactly what all of these cases recognize, that uh, in Board of Trade versus uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission, what they tell the um, the plaintiff is that you can, when, if and when an arbitration arises, you can seek to enjoin that arbitration. And that's why you don't have standing now and it's not ripe now. So that's what all of these cases are saying is that in all of the cases where um, plaintiffs are just sort of uh, trying to challenge the mere inclusion of an arbitration clause, the, the courts say you have to wait un until that arbitration clause is enforced against you. And here it's it's a highly hypothetical chain of events under which that arbitration clause would ever be invoked against them. Um, as to the two plaintiffs here, Mr. Weissman, for example, uh, on sort of plaintiffs kind of um, 
desired product theory of standing, he does not even have that type of standing because he has already traveled on Amtrak subject to the arbitration clause. Mr. Llewellyn's claims are simply that he has a new job that may require him to travel um, to cities that are served by Amtrak. And then I would just refer the court in terms of its questions about imminence to, um, to Mr. Llewellyn's claims themselves, which are at JA 19, where he says that when he's choosing a mode of transportation, he considers a variety of factors, including costs, travel time, schedule, and personal convenience. In some circumstances, Amtrak may be the best choice for him. And in those circumstances, he would like to be able to travel on Amtrak without being subject to an arbitration provision. So there's not even imminence as to their, their um, desired travel on Amtrak, let alone their, uh, the, the idea that arbitration, a dispute would ever arise and the arbitration clause would ever be uh, invoked against them. All right, but counsel, how do you uh, distinguish cases like Consumer Federation of America on that basis? So your honor, I think those cases are distinguishable on, on a number of bases. And I, I would start with what Judge Rogers pointed out just as an initial matter, which is that of course Amtrak is not an agency and is not subject to the APA, but sort of even setting that aside um, and assuming for purposes of these desired product cases that they're applicable in this context. Uh, you do have to consider the injury in light of the claims asserted. And when you look at plaintiff's complaint, the claims asserted are all about their loss of a constitutional right uh, by losing access to a judicial forum in the event a dispute arises. Their claims aren't even framed as kind of, I would like to actually purchase a product and the agency has acted arbitrarily and capriciously in denying me access to that product. Um, but even assuming again that their desired product theory of injury is what the injury is as opposed to what's actually asserted in their complaint, which is the loss of an Article Three forum for judicial redress of grievances. The Coalition for Mercury Free Drugs case uh, shows us that there are important limitations on even those desired product uh, cases, which are that what you have to, what the agency's action has to do is to make the product not readily available or unreasonably priced. And as both uh, Judge Rogers and Judge Silberman were pointing out with respect to both the Orangeburg case and the, um, the Chamber of Commerce versus SEC case, what's really going on in these cases is, is economic injury. That's really what's motivating the court. Here, there's no, no kind of uh, suggestion at all that there's any kind of economic injury to plaintiffs. There's no suggestion that what Amtrak has done by instituting an arbitration clause has made the product either not readily available to plaintiffs or unreasonably priced to plaintiffs. All right, so if they change the complaint and it said something to the effect of Mr. Weissman uh, does not want to be forced to drive or take other transportation, I'm reading from the paragraph eight, he now says, which may be more inconvenient, but if they said if it was more inconvenient, more burdensome, more expensive, would that, would that give them standing? I don't think so, Your Honor. And I think it goes to the questions that you were posing to Mr. Joshi, which were about any kind of limiting principle. If plaintiffs can simply allege that they would like a product to be uh, as it is, they're simply different than, than as, as it is. There's simply no limiting principle whatsoever on, on their theory of standing. Um, they've, they've not only sort of not even alleged that travel is imminent, but the idea that they will then develop a dispute and that dispute will then, um, Amtrak will invoke the arbitration clause against them for purposes of that dispute is simply, uh, as the cases have said, purely speculative. It's a someday or maybe type of injury that doesn't give rise to, uh, to Article Three jurisdiction. Anything further? If the court has no further questions, we ask the court to affirm the district court. Thank you. Uh, thank you, counsel. Counsel for appellants? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, not, there's not a, first of all, not every case has, has held that the plaintiff must 
wait until arbitration. The Boeing case, which we cited in our briefs, uh, held that if it's condition, an unlawful condition, the plaintiff's claim that the arbitration condition is an unlawful condition on access to, in that case, the credit, then that the plaintiff has standing. That's um, actually, that's, that, I thought that case was brilliantly uh, handled by the 11th Circuit. And they draw the distinction between two parts of the case. One part where they recognize there is standing because you have to assume the merits, even though the merits are weak. Uh, and the second part, they indicate there's lack of standing. So they follow the point that Judge Jackson made at the outset, which is you always have to ask yourself the question. You have to assume the validity of the merits when you talk about standing. But, uh, and that's what the, the 11th Circuit did, just dividing up two parts. Now, I, I have a, pro a problem that the case seems to go away when your proposition is your injury is you are forced to waive the right when you buy the ticket with that clause, you are forced to waive the right to subsequently challenge the legitimacy of arbitration when, a, when an incident arises. But you've waived the right to do so. You've waived the right to argue that it's unconstitutional. You waive the right that it's contrary to statute. Counsel on the other side, wait a minute, counsel on the other side says that's not true. We would never take the position you waive the right to make a le those legal arguments. We would make the argument that the arbitration clause is legal and you're bound by it, but we wouldn't take the position that simply by buying the ticket, you waive your right to make this argument. So, so I, in that event, where's the dispute? So that's the nub of it though. The plaintiffs would be bound by it. If the plaintiffs win this case on the merits, they would not be bound by any arbitration. There's not a right in this case I can think of where the plaintiff is in a worse position because of the delay, but they would be here because they will be forced to enter into an arbitration agreement if they take Amtrak. And then but, they- But counsel, what you haven't dealt with, it seems to me, and this is simply a matter of allegations, I understand. But as Amtrak pointed out, they handle a lot of claims directly without invoking arbitration. We don't know how, if your clients have a claim sometime in the future, whether Amtrak would choose to resolve it directly or invoke arbitration. That's one major problem, or that's two major problems. Then the mm -hmm. third problem, it seems to me, is whether you ultimately prevail or not is a different question, but at least counsel for Amtrak has assured the court repeatedly today that it is not taking the position that the mere purchase of a ticket with an arbitration clause constitutes a waiver by your clients of their right to challenge that clause. And I understand your argument citing some cases that under the FAA, there are limited charges, uh, limited challenges that you can make to arbitration. But the type of challenges you are arguing, namely that it's unconstitutional, that is not what I understand those cases to hold. And you haven't cited any. No, well, yes, arbitration has not been used by the government against the public. So you're not gonna have too many cases involving a constitutional challenge. I know you insist on referring to the government here, but at least the Supreme Court has not identified to the contrary. It is said that Amtrak is not a government agency. The Supreme Court has twice said that Amtrak is bound by the constitution. They are a government agency to that extent. That's correct. But when Amtrak responds to a complaint and claim that your client may have in the future, it's not acting as the government, although you keep suggesting it is. Can I, can I ask a question, Mr. Joshi? Just, I know we're short on time and I've been sitting here trying to figure out why I'm so confused by all of this. And I think it's at least conceivable that there are 
two different theories of injury that are floating around here, and I'm trying to understand which one you are claiming. On the one hand, you could have a theory of injury that we are injured because we do not have access to, the, to a product that we desire. And in that sense, you rely on the cases that seem to suggest that. And in that sense, the product we desire is a ticket without an arbitration clause. And all the stuff about how bad it is with respect to constitutional rights is just explaining to us why you desire to have this arbitration free, you know, this, this, this ticket without that clause, because all those things are terrible, but really I'm injured because I want this product and I don't have it, all right? That's one theory. I hear Judge Silberman actually positing a different theory of injury. It is, I'm injured because under these circumstances, I'm being forced to waive a constitutional right to trial. And what he, or I'm being forced to waive my constitutional rights in some way. And what he's saying is, but what if, what if the, fact of the matter is that you're really not being forced to waive. Isn't this a frivolous case? Don't we just, you know, get rid of it on that basis? Um, and so what are you saying? Are you actually re resting on a desired products theory or on some theory related to um, the, the forced waiver of your constitutional rights? So it's, it's the first one. The, the forced waiver is simply the context. But Okay. Um, but but it's, it's, it's absolutely the first one. If we prevail on the merits, Amtrak, right. would, Amtrak would have to offer the plaintiffs here a ticket that did not have an arbitration. Clause. All right. So if it's the first one, I say, but blue armrests. Right. <laughs> I say you can't be right because the person who wants blue armrests as their desired product is not really injured, are they? And you then start talking about the constitutional right again and how arbitration is. So is there a difference in terms of the injury that you uh, uh, suffer in the desired product world based on the nature of the thing in that way? Well, I think the the, the, of the desire. Well, certainly I think this case is a lot easier than the Blue Home Rest case because there is a contract. The plaintiffs are bound by that contract. Amtrak concedes the plaintiffs are bound by the contract. If they win, they would not be bound by that contract. But every and, consumer transaction involves a contract of some nature, right? Sometimes it's written, sometimes it's not. Amtrak could put blue arm armrests in its contract. So that can't be your distinction, right? Well, the blue armrest doesn't bind plaintiffs to anything. Uh, maybe, maybe if, you, if the court wants to make a distinction there, that's, that's one thing. But I mean, here the, the contract would actually have legal effect on plaintiffs. And, and I take your point that maybe that gamble pays off and the plaintiffs are never hauled into arbitration. But the only time they have to make that decision is when they buy the ticket. And they, they don't have the opportunity later to, to rethink their choice or say, well, now there's a dispute pending. I want to get out of this arbitration agreement. Except and, isn't that what Judge Silverman says they do later? They can always say later this they, was not a good thing? On the best of scenarios, what I, and what I understood understood Judge Silverman to be saying is plaintiffs can raise a legal challenge in an Article III court, despite all the hurdles we mentioned in our brief, and get a de novo review of whether Amtrak's condition is constitutional or not, or lawful or not. But that, that's a legal risk. The, the plaintiffs, plaintiffs um, if they don't want to take that legal risk, the only thing, the only option they have available is to not consent in the first place. And the only time they have to not consent is when they buy the ticket. And all so right. that's- I think we have your argument and we will take the case under advisement. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Case number 20-1206 et al, Delaware Riverkeeper Network and Maya Van Rossum, the Delaware Riverkeeper Petitioners versus Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Ms. Manahan for the petitioners Delaware Riverkeeper et al, Mr. Blasey for the petitioner West Rock Hill Township, Mr. Fish for the respondent, Mr. Marwell for the intervener. Morning, Council. 
Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Casey Manahan, representing petitioners, Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and Maya Van Rossum, the Delaware Riverkeeper. Thank you. I will so be addressing you. Will represent that petitioner and the arguments on behalf of the West Rock Hill Township will be presented by Mr. Blasey. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, please proceed, Mrs. Manahan. This challenge is about FERC's blinkered view of a pipeline project's environmental impact and unquestioning acceptance of the applicant's business goals, which led it to conclude that the Adelphia Gateway Pipeline was required by the public convenience and necessity. Council, this decision I ask, was can I ask a question at the threshold? Um, I'm sort of stunned by the number of arguments presented in the brief. Uh, I've always thought that when a, an appellant or a petitioner raises that many arguments, they lose a little bit of their focus. Would you tell me what you think your two strongest arguments are? Yes, Your Honor. Well, our two, our two strongest arguments here are essentially that FERC failed to take a hard look at the proposal. Uh, by well, not that's a general upstream. point. That's a general point. Go, go to the specifics. Which, which, which are the, the specifics errors do you think they made? Uh, one of the specific errors that they made, Your Honor, was not considering the upstream downstream impacts, essentially the, the impacts associated with, with the production and burning of the, the natural gas. Uh, Is it downstream Which or has an effect. Are you talking about downstream or upstream? Well, both, Your Honor, and it stems from the same error, which is a failure to, to follow um, the NEPA regulations, uh, and specifically um, that section 1502.22, which is now 1502.21, um, which requires them when to seek out information about impacts, which they, in this case, they chose not to do. Um, and if they, if the impact, if the information regarding those impacts is not available to use alternative methods of measuring those impacts, which is an error that they committed in considering upstream impacts, downstream impacts, and the climate change impacts of, of the project. Are you, what, talking, what? Are, you, are you talking about that cost uh, figure? What, 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 what are you talking about specifically? Well, in the context of the measuring the significance of the climate change impacts of the project, the social cost of carbon is a method that, that we believe that FERC was required to use because it's generally accepted by the scientific community. Uh, here's my, uh, here's, so, I have several questions concerning that. This is an uh, environmental assessment. This is not an EIS, right? Correct. And uh, are, why would you take the position that the social cost has to be measured in an EA? EA? the preliminary step to just determine whether it's significant or not. If you require that to be used, which is the most difficult calculation you could possibly come up with, aren't you merging the EA into the EIS? Aren't you saying the EA doesn't work anymore? You have to go to an EIS uh, from the very beginning? Well, Your Honor, we, our position is that FERC should have performed an EIS. Uh, and it should have in that EIS considered the social cost of carbon metric as a way of measuring the climate change impact. Of the in other words, it was, in your view, arbitrary and capricious to just use an EA. Uh, well, yes, Your Honor. And as a first step, uh, agencies, of course, can, can begin with an EA to determine, you know, the scope uh, or the nature of the environmental impacts. But uh, the, the EA also comes with the conclusion that there was no significant impact, which here is arbitrary and capricious without even measuring the significance of the there climate is, change. There's no the requirement to use the social cost in the EA. It's an option, but there's no requirement. You can say there's a requirement in the EIS, but it's certainly not in the EA. It's an option, right? Uh, the, the EA is used to as an initial matter, try to get a try to get a grasp of the scope of the environmental impacts of the project and to measure the significance. They are required to measure the significance of an impact in the EA. Right, but they don't they have to, to. They don't have to use the social cost calculation in an EA. They may have uh, our position in an EIS. 
but not in an EA. They, they would have to use it in the EA, Your Honor, in order to measure the significance. That's not the way I read the regulations. And they point the regulations say it's an option at the EA. And, state. and also, Council, can you address whether and to what extent this very discussion was had before the agency? Because I, I, I didn't appreciate that you had made this point, the discussion of whether and to what extent the EA versus EIS required the use of the social cost of carbon tool. So I'm trying to assess whether or not this is even something that you know you've preserved. Uh, yes, in our in our um, in our comments, we had specifically noted this is on in uh, the record number 890. It was not in the joint appendix, um, but record number 890 at page 60. Uh, we stated the social cost of carbonization is an appropriate tool here, where there are alternative modes of NEPA evaluation are insufficiently uh, specific. Yes, so that is what- that, Did you say that the applicable regulations require the, the use of that tool in the EA context versus EIS? I thought that was the conversation you were having with Judge Silberman right now. Uh, yes, for, for specific, well, we did cite the, uh, the provision, you know, the section 1502.22 provision in support of that statement um, in the context of an, an EA or an EIS, that here we would say that there's essentially when you need to measure significance, when you need to conclude that there is no significant impact, uh, that is the method by which you should measure significance based on the regulations provided by CEQ. So could I just clarify so I understand? I understand um, you may have argued that, let me back up. I thought your argument was that the EA was arbitrary and capricious in part because the agency had declined to measure certain emissions. And to the extent that the agency had, in a number of cases, repeatedly rejected the use of the social cost of carbon, you suggested that there was a way for uh, the agency to measure this impact. Isn't that the nature of the argument that's being made to the agency? It, yes. it, what I'm just yes. trying to be clear about is from the beginning, I thought your position was that the agency had to do more than an EA where it was rejecting using measuring tools that were available. And the commission, the commission, the agency explained why it wasn't using the social cost of carbon. All right. In other words, correct. Yes, I, I'm just trying to understand. I mean, the agency and the agency council can tell me I'm wrong, but wasn't it obvious to the agency what the petitioners wanted the agency to do? And the agency's response was, we have determined that it is not possible for us to do this for the following reasons. And you and the others um, challenge that reasoning. Isn't that how the case comes to us? Correct. Yes, uh, the, the, the reasons that FERC put forth uh, for not using the social cost of carbon were not responsive to their obligation to use generally accepted uh, scientific methods such as the social cost of carbon, which in the past they have not contested that it is generally accepted in the scientific community. And they also did not address our argument about the fact that uh, monet monetized measures, economic measures are appropriate in the context of NEPA. It does not need to be tied to a specific uh, environmental harm at a specific site, the, the social cost of carbon is a completely valid way of measuring 
the significance of the impact of climate change. Can I? Can um, I just, and it can be. So, I, I hear you saying, and I tried to write it down because there's no transcription live right now, um, that there, the reasons that FERC gave were not responsive to their obligation to use this tool. And so what I'm homing in on is whether when you argued before FERC, you said you have an obligation to use this tool because it is scientifically valid or whatever, or were you just arguing that it's scientifically valid and you should use this tool, it's a good thing, other people have used it, et cetera. I understood your prior argument to be more in the nature of the second kind of discussion as it has been you know, before FERC and they use the same arguments as to why they have chosen not to use it. But I did not perceive you to be making an argument that the law, some regulation, creates an obligation to use this tool under these circumstances. So where in the record do you say, FERC, we're not arguing as a persuasive matter to you about how good this tool is. We're saying you have no choice. Do you say that somewhere? And was there a discussion? And, the, and then this implicates Judge Silverman's concern or argument, which is if that was the nature of your discussion, is that true <laughs> that in the EA context, they have an obligation to use the social, you know, this tool? Well, the, what the regulations require FERC to use is a generally accepted scientific method to measure the significance of the climate change impacts of this project. We have, we and many others have put forth the social cost of carbon as exactly such a method. Uh, so to the extent that there is no other method identified uh, in the record or otherwise, they are required to use a generally accepted uh, method, which they have also agreed that the social cost of carbon is. Um, and essentially, you know, the, the FERC's beyond just the climate change impacts, uh, FERC failed to completely um, account for both the upstream and downstream impacts of the project. Uh, in, in the context of upstream impacts, um, the, the production of natural gas is an indirect in effect of the project. Certification would result in a reasonably foreseeable increase in availability of natural gas. Um, but here, FERC argued that because of the interconnected nature of natural gas pipelines, it somehow has no way of determining where the gas is coming from and asserts that there's no data in the record showing that the project is even necessary to bring the gas to market. Um, simply because the gas will travel through another pipeline first does not mean that the increased production is not reasonably foreseeable. It doesn't remove it from the realm of impacts that it's required to consider under NEPA. Um, and as then Commissioner Glick recognized in a 2018 dissent, uh, adding capacity does spur demand. And if a proposed pipeline neither e increases the supply of natural gas nor decreases the price, then it's hard to imagine why that pipeline would be, pipeline would be needed in the first place. Um, here, we're not asking FERC to hypothesize about where the natural gas will be produced. Rather, they must follow the NEPA regulations, the, the, the regulations cited previously, Section 1502.22, to at least first attempt to, to obtain the information. Uh, and if they cannot obtain the information for whatever reason from the applicant, then they need to take the, the next step, which is to use other methods of determining what the upstream impacts are, such as uh, using the structure of the interstate transmission gas lines and using historical data about well usage. But isn't, uh, isn't all of that beyond the, isn't it sort of the upstream? Isn't that really speculative in a way that is unhelpful? I mean, how can they possibly know what, unless in the absence of the kinds of data that you say they can't get? So they try, they ask for data, they try to sort of based on um, what, what facts exist, predict. Uh, but if they can't do anything more than that, I don't understand why it wouldn't just be sheer speculation as to how these, this, this pipeline would, would affect people upstream. Well, in this circumstance, they didn't ask. They didn't take that first step of trying to get the information about where the gas would be sourced from. And essentially that's, that's where they, 
erred at first. And then secondly, uh, as we put forth in our, in our comments, there are methods of determining where gas is likely to be produced. And I think one of, one of the main things that we should focus on here is that what this is, is a certificate for a pipeline saying that it's necessary. This pipeline is needed. We need the gas to be transported on this pipeline. We need the gas. But haven't we that, said that, many times that, I mean, they looked at precedent agreements. They looked at, um, yeah, they had individual purchasers, I think, that, that they included. And, and, and hasn't this court sanctioned that kind of, analysis and reasoning in the past? Well, specifically and most recently in this court's opinion in Burkhead, uh, the, the court left open the, the, the circumstance under which a petitioner such as Riverkeeper uh, claims that the commission didn't seek out the information needed to make those upstream determinations. And that is what we're claiming here. Um, and in, in the context of the, the precedent agreements, uh, you know, we our argument is that they uh, they they failed on the on the to rationally explain why the project has a market need because they relied exclusively on those precedent agreements. Excuse me, um, so may I ask you a question? I I got a little confused. Um, do I take you to be arguing that the NEPA issue is to be dis the, the agency is wrong? in first deciding whether there's a need for this pipeline, whether it's in the public convenience and necessity. And then secondly, looking at NEPA, you seem to be suggesting that NEPA is wrapped up in the first step and, and that it's arbitrary and capricious for the agency to divide it into two steps. Do I understand you correctly? Uh, Your Honor, I'm sorry. The the first step uh, is. Could you identify the first step, please? Well, the first, uh, the agency looks to see whether there is a need. Public, uh, put aside NEPA. It just looked to see whether there is a need for this pipeline, right? Public convenience and Correct. necessity. Then it looks to NEPA. Did you suggest that that's wrong? That you had to look, oh. you had to look at NEPA in the first step to determine whether there's public convenience and necessity? Do you make that argument? I, I, I got that impression. Well, in, the, the NEPA analysis informs the ultimate conclusion that the pipeline is required by the public convenience and necessity. The, so, in other the, words, the, so in other words, you're challenging the agency's practice, which goes on forever, which is you first decide whether there's a need for the pipeline public convenience and necessity, and then you look to NEPA to see whether it's environmental impact. Do you challenge that? Uh, no, Your Honor, the, the need, they do determine the need, and then the need is balanced against the adverse impacts that are that are considered in the NEPA analysis. So, but the, the so, need essentially you, so you agree NEPA is the second step? Separate they, step. They do. FERC has stated in the past that they do both at the same time. Essentially, they proceed. The environmental analysis proceeds at the same time. But yes, the, the adverse effects are considered. Yeah. At a second. Oh, then I misunderstood your brief because you're not challenging that. Uh, not not exactly, Your Honor. The, what what we're challenging the fact that they they accepted the applicants assertions of market need without looking further beyond the precedent agreement, which then, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that, goes to, that, the goes to, that goes to the first step, public convenience, and necessity, yes. necessity, not NEPA. Well, then the, the NEPA analysis was also similarly deficient, which then minimized the adverse effects of the project and threw off the entire balancing inquiry, which which is what uh, FERC takes part in when it concludes that the that the project is required by the public convenience and necessity. So essentially, our assertion is that it's been it's been skewed by the fact that 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 FERC did not look beyond the precedent agreement to determine need. In other words, look beyond the precedent agreement to look at mark, other market factors, other indications that perhaps this this gas is not needed. 
Um, and then in considering the adverse impacts of, of the construction and operation of the pipeline, it failed to consider upstream impacts, downstream impacts, climate change impacts, um, and also the connected project, uh, the Penn East pipeline. So those two errors threw off the entire Natural Gas Act balancing inquiry that, that FERC takes part in when it decides to certificate the pipeline. Anything further? Uh, no, Your Honor, I see I'm over my time. That's fine, we, we asked some questions. All right, Council for West Rock Hill Township, Mr. Blazing, Mr. Blakey. Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Doug Blasey. I am counsel to West Rock Hill Township. Um, I will be a seeking to address what I would call micro issues in this dispute where Ms. Manahan, if you will, I'm putting words in her mouth or uh, for her, but kind of the macro issues. And if Judge Silberman were to ask me, were there two kind of precise things we're concerned about? Um, I will get to them in greater detail, but there are. One is um, the site chosen for a new compressor station is an existing uh, piece of property in Quaker called the Quakertown site, which is 1.5 acres. Um, and it now contains, I think, a meter station and um, a pipeline, uh, and that's it. There is no compressor station there. Um, and there is a nearby 41 acre property that has uh, facilities, has the same pipelines and has electric utility lines on it that was rejected essentially by the applicant and FERC as being more suitable. And we say, and we'll, I'll show you shortly, uh, both FERC, FIMSA and FEMA documents that suggest in general compressor stations should be on a minimum to 10 to 15 acres and normally or often can run up to 40 acres, and that's an industry practice. So we find it shocking and dangerous that FERC approved you putting an industrial facility on a 1.5 acre site um, and did not adequately consider the impacts on all the neighbors. So that in short is what I'm going to focus on and why I call it the micro issues uh, involved here and we think the environmental assessment, which by the way, at least from uh, the old days when I was more active in the federal government and doing these things, uh, an environmental assessment wouldn't necessarily run 331 pages. So it's a practice now, it appears by FERC, to put an awful lot into the environmental assessment. Is that and, good or bad, Mr. Blasey? Does that well, help it's, you or hurt it, you? It, it becomes more mechanical is what I'm really suggesting, Your Honor, that they've kind of mechanized the process and then having done the EA, they can move either to an environmental impact statement or a FONSI finding of no significant impact. And I suspect, I haven't done the statistics that fairly generally there's a FONSI that follows and they don't need to do an environmental impact statement. Now, if they had addressed our concerns fully in the EA, I wouldn't be here, but I think they would get be more likely addressed fully if there was an environmental impact statement, because that's where alternatives need to be, you know, assessed in in detail. The hard look doctrine comes in, and also cumulative impacts. Uh, would be involved. So the environmental impact statement process kind of of necessity pushes you further. But what we're objecting to now is essentially the back of the hand rejection of what we think are very germane local safety concerns and disrespecting the role of local government in trying to protect other neighboring uses from what is a significant industrial facility on a postage stamp size property. All right, so what's your understanding of FERC's reason? I mean, it's not, you say they did an environmental, we see they did an environmental impact, uh, excuse me, assessment. They did address this issue. And so what, why is it insufficient for them to come to the conclusion that 
uh, the site that you prefer would have uh, required a larger facility, et cetera? It, it, there's a, it's kind of a compound answer. I feel we, they never explained or justified the use of a small site. That's the core reason. Now my township, my client would prefer the alternative site to begin with because it's not in their township. But if it were to be located in their township, this acreage and size should be sufficient to protect neighboring uses. So the, the, the reasons given by FERC we find are inadequate. It basically says for the site it chose, oh, it's one, the compressor station itself. Now this is a fairly large structure because it's gonna be 1.2 acres of building, heavy footings and foundations. It's an industrial structure, 40 feet high where there's none there now. It will fit because the applicant owns 1.5 acres there. But then when it publishes guidance and I, they're, they're in the record, this is the cover page of the FERC guidance what do I need to know about an interstate natural gas pipeline on my property? They talk about generally compressor stations on 10 to 40 acres. And another document by FEMA and FIMSA also referenced in the, uh, our, our, both our argument and briefs. This is um, called hazardous mitigation planning practices for land use planning and development near pipelines. There, when they talk about compressor stations, these two federal agencies say generally, these stations are placed on 15 to 40 acres. So for FEMA or FERC rather, in its decision to simply say, oh, it fits on 1.5 acres and be silent on the safety implications of what is a very different facility than a pipeline in the ground with the right of way, I, we find is, inherently arbitrary and capricious and unresponsive to its duties, even in the EA process, for getting, forget getting to the environmental impact statement. They need to explain to people why what they're doing is appropriate. And if there appear to be contradictions in the process, explain them away, justify it. So what do people at the end of the day feel or know? Oh, the government's treated me fairly. I understand its decision. I was either right or wrong on this. The things I was right on, they kind of changed to deal with. And where I misunderstood something, they've explained it so I can go home and sleep at night. We have people that are afraid to be near this facility because they have no such justification, Your Honor. And that's what, at core, we find wrong. Now, the second issue is when it can to talking about the alternative, which in an EA, they don't have to do as completely. They, they kind of ignore the fact that it's 41 acres, 41 acres with the same pipelines going through them, 41 acres that has a high tension transmission line going through it. So if they did need electricity, there's plenty of it there and say instead, oh, it's one point, it's 2.3 acres because they've only so used 2.3 acres. Are you saying they didn't say anything about the downside of putting it on the alternative facility? They did. And we thought those were fairly shallow reasons, but they support it by saying, oh, they're only using 2.3 acres. So they never really addressed the size availability and the isolation potential that that site would offer. Uh, for a new compressor station being located. Now, you could have done it elsewhere. If they thought there were downsides, and these are fairly, in my, we, I can talk about them, but they're speculative. Um, they could look at the site where they are, then acquire enough property so that you can safely build it there. Instead, they've done it on what I call a postage stamp, and the neighboring uses are all residential, they could be within 25 feet of the fence line. Uh, FERC FIMSA rules suggest, oh, we got to be concerned about neighboring uses that might create a fire hazard on, to the compressor station. Forget the compressor station having been a hazard to us, but talk about the neighbors. You could have a backyard barbecue. You could have a fire pit. You can have your kids running a motor, you know, a motor, what do you call them? Those little hot rods, motorized hot rods. 
you got to cut your grass and you're 25 foot away from a compressor station that's near the fence line. So these are among other things. Now, one other thing with the postage stamp size lot, there wasn't adequate room to move around it with emergency equipment, which is another- I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm I'm mindful of the time. Um, Were these concerns, what you are uh, expressing now, raised to FERC in the period of time as they discussed? I'm I'm not sure I completely- Were these concerns, I miss your verb. Were, Were they raised? Were, was, yes. were they brought to FERC's attention? Yes. This lot is too small, et cetera, et cetera. Is that in the record? And we did it in three steps, Your Honor, and they're kind of laid out in the brief, but let me quickly do it. Um, the first one, and it, uh, it was before my involvement, so they weren't thinking per, per se only about environmental impact statements and uh, the permitting, they were thinking, the township was thinking about local zoning and setbacks. So the first set of comments the township filed early was about zoning and our setbacks. And we think this is too tight. Then when that was seemed to be being rejected, we, they came to me and they asked, and we looked for an environmental and engineering consultant to try to go into it in more detail. So a second set of comments went in and was accepted by FERC, uh, by RT environmental services, looking at safety setbacks, fire hazards and and other uh, components of site design where we found this inadequate and submitted that in great detail and then started to raise the pamphlet issues themselves and show other fire sites. And then when that again seemed to be being rejected um, after in the in the order in our petition for rehearing, we submitted all of these issues again in greater detail, including the pamphlets to make sure they were in front of the agency. So, all right, so as a matter of administrative law, having fully uh, presented the various concerns that you have, what is arbitrary about FERC's consideration of those concerns and its rejection? Are you saying that they weren't sufficiently responsive in the sense that they didn't tell you, they didn't respond to your comments? I mean, your argument, it, 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 as a matter of administrative law, I'm struggling to see whether your argument is just FERC chose something we dislike and we told them very much that we disliked it and we gave them other options and they rejected them or that they've done something that we have considered to be a violation of administrative mm-hmm. principles because they haven't looked at what you've given them or they haven't explained why it is that they've rejected it. So are you in the administrative law world or in policy world in terms of your objection? Well, there can be disagreements over policy. And so, uh, and there there's deference to an agency making it. But I would say there's both substantive and procedural failures. The questions we raise, we think deserved greater investigation than provided. Now, I would say that th- falls to the EI, e, to the to the FONSI, which I think was inappropriate and not justified. And if you then don't have a FONSI, you do an EIS. So these would have been developed more fully, investigated more fully in the EIS. Now, on the substantive side directly, I think to have a bulletins and publish to publish to the world these pamphlets and descript, describing things, and I'll mention a Third, cir- third Circuit case in just a moment, the, 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 FERC, the FEMA one is 40 or 50 pages, and n- not all on compressor stations, by the way, but talking about what is normal in the industry. Now, I think they want to talk normal rather than hazard, because I think there's a greater hazard here, and that's a little bit no-no to address. But if you're saying... 15 to 40 acres or 10 to 40 acres is the normal to then in your record say, oh, 1.2 is enough, 1.5 is enough. And that's good enough. That's not good enough to not be arbitrary and capricious decision-making in my judgment. You've got to explain it. Now, maybe you say, oh, this is like a nuclear reactor. We're buying putting 10 foot concrete walls around it. There can be no this, there can be no that. We don't need that larger space in this setting. There's none of that 
It's just that, trust us, we think it's okay here. And then when they, you say, well, you know, you do have an alternative site that got plenty of room. Oh, well, you know, they don't want to use it. And by the way, it's only 2.3 acres when it's 40 some. So the, it's casual the way these issues are being dismissed. That's really what it amounts to. Now, an immediate neighbor, the McCarthy's, who I was, I've been authorized to say a few words on behalf of, which support our position, are, are immediate and are concerned about noise and vibration. They submitted documents and references to documents that they, they thought made their properties unlivable. They feel they never got adequate response. So if you look at our briefs on these things, we, we're the locals who feel we're adversely impacted and we're not being treated in a transparent and fair way. Lastly, let me just say one last thing here regarding the township. It's a unit of government. Now, yes, the federal government's much bigger, clearly has some preemptive rights here and authorities as FERC has, but has been told to work in cooperation with other governments that have responsibility for public health and safety. So the township, which has a land use and zoning role, wants to be able to tell its citizens that the immediately adjacent residential zoning is lawful and safe. Now, if it feels it can't do that, given these tight boundaries and the concerns we've expressed and tries to put conditions on the future use of that property, it runs afoul of condemnation, eminent domain, taking of property rights. So the township is trying to say to its neighboring government, FERC, and say, help us, serve with us to articulate a result that people feel confident is safe to them and to the immediately adjacent uses. And that's what we feel has been lacking in the way these kind of narrow or micro points have been dealt with. It's okay, trust us, we're here from the federal government and you can do that, right? And, and that's not an answer. So right. it's or, or procedural in terms of the EIS process. All right, thank you. Why don't we hear from a respondent, FERC, Mr. Fish. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court, Jared Fish for the commission. Uh, if I may, I'd like to focus on four issues that appear to be uh, where the panel is focusing, social cost of carbon issue, the upstream, downstream, indirect effects, uh, the issue of market need in our balancing, and uh, Quakertown compressor station. The first matter on the social cost of carbon issue, uh, petitioners did not preserve this issue for this court uh, to confer jurisdiction on this court. Uh, Ms. Manahan quoted a statement from their comments on the environmental assessment record 830. The, the argument has to be made in a rehearing application to the commission after initial order is issued. That is not a, uh, a quote from the rehearing application. So it's not preserved on that basis alone. Now looking didn't at the rehearing cite, application- Didn't they cite, the, cite a regulation in the hearing? Rehearing application. Oh, they, Your Honor, they cited a sub provision of that regulation, 1502.22b4, but their argument was not that even if you accept the Commission's reasons for not using the social cost of carbon tool, you still have to turn to theoretical, uh, generally accepted practices in the field because you, you can't rely on only ideal methods. They did not make that argument. To the contrary, they, they argued that social cost of carbon tool is the best out there. They said, we, we perfectly could measure um, uh, the economic significance of, of greenhouse gas emissions. How do you distinguish the circumstances in terms of preservation uh, in this case from the CINOS, which I understand had a similar kind of scenario? Your Honor- And, and, and this court held that they had preserved it. Correct, Your Honor, but but there, and this is in the addendum to our response to Delaware Riverkeepers 28J letter, there, the petitioners expressly stated that the commission can't just rely on universally accepted methods. They have to look to less than ideal methodologies um, because this, this regulation uh, compels that. There is no argument that even if accepting FERC's explanation for rejecting the tool as true, this regulation still says, no, you can't, you can't just rely on ideal information. 
uh, we accept that sometimes there's unavailable or incomplete information, and then you have to turn to theoretical approaches. All Delaware Riverkeeper argued was, this is the best out there. In fact, the next sentence after they cite the regulation is to say, the social cost of carbon tool is better than other methodologies. And they say that because it monetizes uh, environmental impacts. Well- Let me ask you though, I don't understand your point. I mean, if the agency has rejected that methodology and given its reasons, and the petition says, um, basically, we disagree with those reasons. It's the best out there, so you have to use it. What more has to be said? Well, I, I personally agree with your honor, um, and I, I would rest on that explanation if it wasn't for uh, Vecinos. Uh, Vecinos said, notwithstanding our reasons for rejecting the tool, we still had to consider other, we still had to consider it under 1502.22b. But I also have a merits answer, and this goes well, to let Judge Let me Sol just be clear. There are many ways of making the same argument. The fact that the argument wasn't a copycat of Vecinos isn't dispositive, is it? Well, it is in this case, Your Honor, because then you just have competing allegations on whether the tool is good or it's not, or, or it's not useful. And the commission gets deference for highly technical judgments in determining that this tool actually is not useful because there's no settled on discount rate. There's uh, no generally accepted method for measuring the incremental impact on the environment using the tool. And uh, there's no uh, criteria for monetizing which impacts are significant for NEPA purposes. So you just did have competing you, substantive take, arguments. Did you take the position that whether or not it's useful it uh, is more appropriate at the EIS stage than the uh, EA stage? Well, Your Honor, I would back, take one step back and say we, 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 we said that uh, we did measure significance here. And that's what petitioners say we needed to use the social cost of carbon tool to do. But we actually did measure the significance of the emissions. We placed, uh, we measured the uh, amount of emissions going to the Kimberly Clark plant. We put no, those I, I understand that. Did you take the position that you didn't have to go to the social cost at the EA stage? Uh, I don't think we said that specifically in looking at the EA versus the EIS. It wasn't presented to, to us in that way in the rehearing application. Um, but so we, we didn't really have an opportunity to address that. I but see. I would say you're. I see you're saying the petitioner didn't raise, the, did not raise the the allegation or the argument that you had to use the social cost? Uh, in, well, that that would put us into EIS land versus EA land. Um, they just said you, you have to use it um, to measure measure significance. Uh, and they you, didn't put that- And your position was? Our position was, as we have said before, and this court has upheld before in Earth Report, Sierra Club Appalachian Voices, that the tool is not appropriate for project level uh, reviews of environmental impacts. And, you know, this Mr. court Fish, is a firm- Can I just clarify, because I understood you right now to say they said they had, you had to use it, or did you mean they said you should use it because it's the best available, et cetera? What, what, what I'm trying to tease out in terms of understanding preservation is whether they made an argument that was essentially an hour based by hour, I mean the case, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, a kind of interpretation argument that you, based on what this regulation says, as long as we can demonstrate that it's scientifically, whatever the language is, scientifically uh, a good tool or whatnot, you then have to use it. Or were they just saying, this is such a great tool you should use it, at which point you repeated the various arguments that you had all along about why you think it's not that great. The latter, Your Honor. All I read, okay. all I read them to be stating is, you know, the only reason they, they even cited the regulation was to quote the phrase generally accepted in the scientific community. And they made no argument on, on that point at all. So that distinguishes this from Vecinos. But there's, to get to Judge Silberman's initial question um, to Ms. Manahan, just looking at the text of 1502.22, um, it does not apply to environmental assessments. It applies by its terms to environmental impact statements. 
And it also states uh, this regulation comes into play when an agency is evaluating reasonably foreseeable significant adverse effects. Well, if you're already evaluating effects that, that the agency has deemed to be significant, you're, you're in EIS land, you're not in EA land, because the whole point of conducting an environmental assessment is to determine whether there are significant effects in the first place. And so Mr. even Fish, on the can I just say that to the, the so I think that discussion about EIS versus EA, EA also sort of implicates the preservation question because what you would expect that someone who was seeking to preserve this argument would have made that point. In other words, they would have said, we understand that the regulation that we're pointing to only applies in EIS, but we are saying that you are required to do this in the EA context as well. Right. But in another question about preservation is in this context in general, isn't there a requirement like in a rehearing context that you have to be very clear on what it is that you are arguing from the standpoint of preservation? Absolutely, Your Honor. And I think that's why Ms. Manahan referred back to their comments on the EA and completely um, ignored the very little that they said in their rehearing application. The focus here is on the rehearing application. This court has said time and again um, in Ameren, in Allegheny Power, the, the rehearing requirement is applied punctiliously. Any objection has to be made explicitly. And anything short of that, any indirect objection, or as we have here, an incorporation by reference, by way of citing in a footnote, a subprovision of a regulation, it does not meet that requirement. So we have both, you know, it's procedurally forfeited, our jurisdictionally forfeited. And even if it wasn't, it's wrong on the merits because we're in EA land, not in EIS land. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the broader point is we did measure significance. Uh, we didn't need to use a social cost of carbon tool. Um, petitioners repeatedly state that the, an economic analysis um, is necessary here, but that's belied by the regulations. 1502.23 uh, expressly says we don't need to conduct a cost benefit right, analysis. So moving, moving to your next, you had four points I think you wanted to make. You said we measured significance. Wasn't there at least uh, a circumstance in which you actually didn't undertake to measure significance and that is, or the, at least the impact. Um, and that is with respect to the downstream impact of the greenhouse gas emissions on a certain segment of the pipeline. Can you talk about that? Why are petitions, uh, petitioners wrong about your obligation to do that and um, the fact that you didn't do it in this circumstance? Right, so Your Honor, I, I wanna be clear, um, we're all talking about the same thing. There's a lot of gas being transported on this pipeline. Uh, petitioners don't challenge uh, the fact that we didn't measure the downstream impact from the 525,000 decatherms that are transported on zone north because that's just pre-existing service. This, this certi certification does not cause any new environmental impacts. They're not challenging our measuring of the uh, gas going to the Kimberly Clark plant. All they're challenging is the 100,000 decatherms on zone, zone south. And that any, so uh, any uh, determination about the resulting greenhouse gas emissions is speculative in, in that case, because we don't know the destination or the end use. Um, Why didn't that, you just, didn't, did, haven't we said that under those circumstances, you can make reasonable inferences Right? Isn't the record such that it's pretty clear that an overwhelming percentage of natural gas being piped in this way is combusted? And why didn't you make those kinds of assumptions and calculate it consistent with that? Well, I, I have a, a couple of answers to that. First, Your Honor, I don't know of any case that says you can take a gross estimate of generalized impacts across the country and apply that to a case specific project level review. As this court said in Burkhead, quoting this court's long ago decision in Calvert Cliffs, NEPA requires case by case fact specific analysis on this particular project. The question is whether the downstream impacts are reasonably foreseeable for this project. Yes, but Even okay, so, but fine. So we have the facts of this case, 100,000 100, or whatever decagrams zone south, we've narrowed it, okay? And you're saying the reason why we didn't try to calculate the greenhouse gas emissions that would come from the transportation of that is because we didn't know where it was going. First of all, there is a footnote 
in the record at one point where you speculate that it, it's going to a particular place or at least part of it, right? Isn't there some discussion I'm trying to find in my notes quickly here? Um, Calpine, don't you talk about Cal, at least some of it is going to Calpine? No, no, Your Honor. No, no. no. We, we, and we expressly stated uh, uh, that in, in the certificate order and the rehearing order, we don't know what's going to Calpine because there are no agreements to take it there. Actually, what, it, what Adelphia found out when we asked them, we did our due diligence under Burkhead. We asked the pipeline whether they knew the end use and destination, and they responded that it was that 100,000 decatherms was being transported further to the interstate grid, either on the Columbia pipeline system or Texas Eastern. That parkway lateral that we're talking about goes to the Calpine plants, but it also goes to the Columbia interstate system and the Texas Eastern interstate system. And so what they, what they know is it goes onto the interstate system, um, not, to the, not to the Calpine plant. So we would okay. be- even so, even so, haven't we said in Sable Trail, at least, that the lack of knowledge of the end user doesn't absolve you of trying to estimate what might happen on the assumption that it's all going to be uh, combusted? Why, why can't you give the upper limit of the potential impact and then maybe it won't be and we'll all be happy, but at least you will have uh, you know, tried to estimate, assuming that it is all consumed. Why didn't well, you do that? No, Your Honor, I, I respectfully disagree that that's what Sable Trail and Burkhead say. If that was the case, where if it's transported on the interstate system, and because we know nationally most gas is combusted, that we have to assume that this gas will be combusted, then Burkhead's rule statement that uh, it, it's not correct in, that in, in all cases, it's reasonably foreseeable gas would be combusted, where they agreed with the commission on that, that statement is nullified. They, there, there's, no, there's no meaning to it. And further, Burkhead said, they, it didn't stop at saying, uh, we should have just uh, foreseen that the gas would be combusted because you know someone might reasonably think that. They said, they spent pages saying, uh, Actually, no, we agree with the commission. We're crediting the commission statement that end use and destination are important. And the problem there was that the commission had not asked the pipeline, the pipeline for that information. They said NEPA I understand, requires- Mr. Mr. Fish, I understand, but I, it seems to me that your argument would make more sense if there was some other alternative out there. If we were in a world in which 50% of natural gas is combusted and 50% of it is treated in some other way, and you say, we don't know which way this is happening, so we can't make the estimate, that's one thing. But I thought there was testimony or something in the record that suggested that like 98% of the natural gas actually ends up in this way. So doesn't that impact the reasonable foreseeability analysis? I, I know, Your Honor, not here, because again, we're talking about the specific project. That 97% figure, does nothing to answer whether the particular gas here is gonna be transported to say uh, a chemical plant and be used as feedstock. And for their part, Riverkeeper concedes that. River, you know, if you look at Riverkeeper's arguments, pages 29 through 30 of their opening brief and uh, page 10 of their reply brief, they agree with us that more information would be useful to determining whether combusting these, uh, this transported gas uh, is reasonably foreseeable. They say, we should have asked the shipper. We should have gone beyond Adelphia, tried to find out end use and destination from the shipper. Well, that argument is jurisdictionally forfeited because they didn't make it in their hearing application. So it's not properly before the court. But on the reply brief, they actually doubled down on that point. They say, yes, it's perfectly possible that the gas transported here could be used as feedstock as opposed to being combusted. But they say, we have this 97% figure, so, so forget about the project level case specific review, just go with that number and think of the implications. If it's enough to just use gross national statistics to determine project level impacts, what, what does that mean for determining impacts on wetlands of a particular project or a, a, you know, a forest service timber sale? Can an agency just rely on gross national generalized figures? But here's for, the for problem, the Mr. Fish. It seems like we are in uh, a sort of a zero sum game world. In other words, fine, I hear that it's, it's um, a project level thing and we really shouldn't be relying on national statistics about what's gonna happen to this gas. But it appears as though FERC plugged in zero 
<laughs> I mean, your assumption as a result of saying we don't know where it's going is we're assuming that it has no impact. So that can't be right. I mean, there must be something that comes of this. And so I'm trying to understand why it would be re reasonable or any more reasonable to allow the agency to assume that there is no effect um, just because we don't know what the end user is going to be. Yeah, I, I, I disagree, Your Honor. Uh, first of all, our responsibility under an environmental assessment as um, set forth in, in Myersville is to make sure we have not ignored any issue. Not that we've resolved every issue, but that we have not ignored every issue. We consider this. And the test is whether an impact is reasonably foreseeable. So that necessarily means that some impacts might not be reasonably foreseeable, even though they will occur. We're, you know, our inquiry does not depend on absolute knowledge of, of what an occurrence will be. If it's not reasonably foreseeable, we don't have an obligation to speculate. You know, NEPA is all about not speculating, to speculate um, on what that uh, ultimate uh, effect would be. And I would just you know, reiterate, this court before has upheld a finding of no significant impact where the commission had less than uh, complete information on downstream significance in uh, Judge Rogers' opinion in Earth Reports, uh, dealing with greenhouse gas emissions from a liquefied natural gas facility. The commission said, we can't, we don't have a reasonable metric for measuring significance of those greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we stated our reasons why, and the court upheld that. They upheld our, our FONSI. Uh, so we're, we're really not in new territory here. And if it was true that we could, we're obligated to speculate based on gross national statistics, then all of that discussion and all of that instruction in Burkhead that we've taken very seriously about trying to gather information on end use and destination uh, is superfluous. And I would just add, we're, it's not as though if, you know, this is really an extreme case where there's really no information on where the gas is going after it's put into the interstate pipeline. I can think of other instances where we might not have the perfect information that, that we had in Sable Trail, where it would be a closer question. Say, we knew the destination of the gas, but it's a big industrial facility that includes both a power plant and a chemical plant. So in that case, we would know the destination for the gas, but we might not be sure on any given day what the end use is. Well, maybe that presents a closer question because you know it's at least, you know, some of the times going to a power plant and some of the times going as chemical, uh, as, as feedstock to a chemical plant. Maybe that's, that's a closer issue, but we're not in that land here. We are, petitioners are asking us to engage in, in total speculation um, about what's happening to this, uh, to this gas. And this, this court's case law respectfully does not, does not require that. Um, as if far as- want us to assume uh, that the gas will be combusted at some point, somewhere nationally. And you had to assume that in every case of a pipeline. Uh, would that shut down all uh, gas production? Uh, or gas transportation? I, I'm, I'm not gas, sure, Your uh, Honor. Not just gas transportation, gas production uh, under FERC's it, jurisdiction. I mean, it, it could. Well, we would still, you know, we're talking about a NEPA review here. So even if even if we had to, you know, make that assumption, uh, I guess, you know, because NEPA is action forcing and does not command a substantive result, maybe there still would be some discretion there. But if we had to assume, if we had to assume that we had to speculate, I guess is a way I, I would um, rephrase, I hope fairly your question, Your Honor, um, then, you know, we would, we would be engaging in, in speculation here. Um, and this court's case law expressly says we, we can't do that. Um, if I might uh, turn briefly to the upstream, well, I, I see I'm out of time. I can turn to the upstream impacts or- uh, Why don't you give us a brief sentence or two? Okay. Uh, Your Honor, the, the petitioners assume that upstream gas production is a reasonably foreseeable proximate cause of this pipeline. And we explain thoroughly paragraph 243 of a certificate order, J596, and rehearing order paragraph 123, uh, J897 to 98, why that's not true. Uh, we explained that uh, the, the causal arrow uh, generally goes from uh, uh, well production first to pipeline construction, that well production is uh, more dependent on changes in gas prices, changes in construction costs, 
changes in uh, national market demand. But we also said, even if you assume the causal arrow goes the other way, and that it goes, you know, you build a pipeline first and that induces new construction. Well, we don't know that any, any uh, well field where this gas is coming from doesn't have another outlet to reach the market. And if that's the case, that breaks the chain of causation because you don't know that this pipeline rather than the other pipeline actually induced that new production. And further, and that was, that words, was an explanation. In other words, your argument, this is not equivalent to the baseball field in Iowa. Just because you build it doesn't mean it'll come. <laughs> right, exactly, Your Honor. <laughs> no, but what I'm hearing, if it's big, it's too big for us to figure out what's happening. Well, in this court, and that's not the assumption underlying the statutes calling for FERC review, much less the regulatory system. Well, Your Honor, this, this court in uh, Sierra Club versus Department of Energy said it's those upstream impacts are not reasonably foreseeable in part because we're talking about a highly reticulated interstate natural gas pipeline system where on any given day, gas could be coming from you know, a source field in Northeast Pennsylvania versus a source field in, in Northwest Pennsylvania or another state entirely. So, and so you know, we don't- What I'm trying to get you to address though, so is that type of argument makes a mockery of the statutory scheme Congress enacted with the idea that FERC, for example, was going to give serious consideration to the objections and do the best it could. No one's asking for it to be you know, a miracle worker here. But the notion that the expert agency created by Congress is unable to provide any guidance here once it decides, well, there's more than one multiple, or there may be multiple explanations, is troubling. And I agree that our court has endorsed this approach from time to time. But it seems we're getting to the point where analysis is becoming more sophisticated and if we need to develop, or if the industry needs to develop tracer systems, we can develop tracer systems. But the notion that big means it's impossible to evaluate. I don't know what's left of Congress's creation of FERC. It's gonna be a rubber Your stamp. Honor. The bigger a project is, the less it can do. No, Your Honor, I respectfully disagree because you could, first of all, you could envision a scenario where, you know, there's uh, developers want to uh, build a new greenfield uh, well, well site for natural gas. And they say, we need a pipeline uh, company to build a pipeline to get it to market. And so this pipeline is, um, it, it is built or the pipelines, you know, built and, and that's enough to induce the, that well production at that particular site. Well, then we have, we, we, you would have causation, or at least it's a closer question, whether you'd have causation because oh, I understand you don't have... there'll be some projects, but what I'm suggesting is, and the pipelines are savvy as to what's happening in the regulatory field and in the judicial field, they know how to put these packages together in order to present FERC with the conundrum it has identified. So I don't think either of us has to speculate about that. That's what we're seeing. And what's left of the regulatory scheme is concerning. That's all I'm suggesting. And I'm not suggesting that our court hasn't said, well, you know, it's up to Congress to do more if it wants more out of the agency. But haven't we more or less reached that point? Well, uh, I, I agree, Your Honor. One way would be for Congress to enact legislation that, that says we need to take a different route here. But I'd also say, first of all, uh, Riverkeeper's arguments on the impacts here, the upstream impacts they want us to look at are highly localized. They talk about new water lines, uh, new roads being built those highly localized environmental impacts will vary from one location to another. You can't, it kind of goes back to the 97% general growth statistic on downstream. You can't just generalize 
uh, the impacts of truck traffic in one location as in another location. So by their no, very I allegations- take, I take the commission's point that you cannot fault us if you don't give us the objection to respond to. So if you want us to look at a regulation and deal with the commission's interpretation and application of it, then cite the regulation. These general objections are simply not enough. I thoroughly Correct. understand that. And so finally, in Vecino's court says, you know, as we often say, the agency creates these regulatory systems. It's deemed to know what its regulatory system provides. So, you know, act in conformity with your regulations. And I think a lot of the argument that you've been making here and in your brief is, you know, nobody made these arguments. It's right. fine to make them now, but it's too late. And so I right. think that these objections in the future are going to have to be more precise. And there may be instances, including in this case, where the court thinks there was an adequate. I, I agree, Your Honor. In Just, terms of notifying the agency. I apologize right. for interrupting. No. Yes, Your Honor. And if I could just pick up on one point you made, because uh, Ms. Manahan also mentioned that they cited 1502.22b with regard to upstream impacts, but they only cited it for the proposition that upstream impacts are reasonably foreseeable. They didn't cite it at all for the proposition that, okay, maybe FERC has all these explanations about why it can't determine whether it's reasonably foreseeable and we don't accept it, but even assuming they're right, you still need to look at theoretical other approaches uh, in the field in order to see if that, you know, if that reasonable foreseeability determination, uh, you know, passes muster. And that goes to your point, Your Honor. Uh, perhaps they could have made a more specific objection. Perhaps they could have cited other methods, tracer analyses uh, that, that we should have employed or they thought we should have employed in order to make a, a more robust uh, determination, but they didn't do so. In fact, everything they say is, it's ipsy dixit. They just say we had uh, information that was reasonably available, but they don't cite anything for, for that proposition. Well, I understand that argument, but I'm a little troubled by the notion that the petitioner is the one who is supposed to be the expert on what is out there in terms of the methodologies that have been developed in the industry or in the academy. Um, when the regulation puts an obligation on FERC, in any event, not to expand this. Anything further? I know you said your time was up and I said, give us a couple of sentences. Anything more? I could give you a couple sentences on market need that might okay. just come up in, in uh, 30 seconds. I think there's a little confusion here on the public need analysis that goes into the balancing public or, or public benefit analysis that goes into the balancing of public benefit versus adverse effect and the uh, finding of public convenience and necessity. They're two different things. The finding of public convenience and necessity is our certificate order. That's our December 2019 order, which by its terms considers both the balancing test and the NEPA analysis. It comes last. And so by arguing in the reply brief at pages five to six that uh, we, did, we determined public convenience and necessity before we conducted the NEPA analysis is just wrong on the record. Um, they're two different things. Uh, and finally, I would just say our finding of no significant impact is reasonable here. 95% of this project is already built. It's already in operation. 81% of the new 4.7 miles of pipeline being built is, is constructed along existing rights of way. And both of the compressor stations, Marcus Hook and Quakertown, are built on existing facility sites, which, as Mr. Blazy stated, already have industrial equipment on them. I thank your honors. I ask that uh, the court deny the petition for review. Well, uh, did the council have an opportunity to fully address the township's arguments? I, I'm happy to address the township's arguments as well. I would- Can you uh, just quickly give us the, the sort of thumbnail as to why Mr. Blazy is wrong? <laughs> yes, yes, your honor. First, our, our obligation under NEPA is to uh, offer a brief discussion of alternatives. We did that by looking at five different alternative or four different alternative sites to the Quakertown site. Um, 
And the question under mini sync is whether we clearly address the issue. We did that for all the five preserved issues. And Mr. Blasey and Ms. Manahan are incorrect in relying on comments they made on the environmental assessment as a basis for arguing that this court has jurisdiction over objections that were not made in their rehearing applications. All right, so let's uh, thank you very much, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Fish. All right, we'll hear from uh, Mr. Marwell for intervener. Thank you, Your Honor. Jeremy Marwell, uh, counsel for intervener at Delphi Gateway. If I could, I'd like to touch briefly on the preservation point, then discuss downstream. And I would also like to talk about the status of the project since we're several months after the briefs that we filed in the court. Uh, with regard to preservation, uh, I, I, we agree with the commission that this issue was not squarely put before the commission in the sense of giving them a fair opportunity to address it. The rehearing request is JA 795. And I think if you read that, there's one sentence with an unexplained footnote in the context of an argument where Delaware Riverkeeper was saying, these are the numbers we think would be generated if you apply the social cost of carbon tool. They said 80 million, 20 billion, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And so to drop an unexplained footnote, particularly in the context where the commission has repeatedly explained its reasons for not using the social cost of carbon, and this court has repeatedly upheld them, we think that glancing reference is not enough to put the commission on notice that they were making the distinct argument that was at issue in Vecinos and that they're making now in this court. With respect now to- Now you're citing 795? That, that's right, Your Honor. That, as I understand it, that is uh, Delaware Riverkeeper's rehearing request before the commission, which is the jurisdictional prerequisite for preserving an argument in the court. Right, uh, I'm just looking specifically um, yeah. Because you say it's not enough to drop a footnote. Yeah, so um, the, the sentence is the first sentence of the second paragraph on that page. Uh, there's the sentence reads the scientific, uh, sorry, the SCC, that's social cost of carbon, is a scientifically derived metric to translate tonnage of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases to the cost of climate harm and remains generally accepted in the scientific community. Footnote 360 is a site to the regulation or a subprovision of the regulation. I, I don't, in the context of what this section of their hearing request is arguing, and given the fact that the requirement to raise an issue with specificity is explicit in the statute, and this court has said you have to raise it with particularity, the argument that I think is now being made, which is regardless of the commission's longstanding arguments and position about why it won't use the social cost of carbon, it had an obligation under that regulation to use it anyway. I don't see that fairly. Well, I appreciate your argument, uh, but I also know that while this court has talked about the obligation to make your objections specific, when we cited that specific requirement in FERC regulation, when the case got to the Supreme Court, it made short shrift of that. All right, um, and said that the, the objection was adequately presented. So I think we have to um, give some uh, credence to the notion that the expert agency knows what's going on here when the argument is presented in the context of arguing that FERC has failed to use this a methodology uh, and we have some authority suggesting that to the extent this court has deferred previously to FERC's notion that uh, this is unreliable, et cetera, that that is no longer um, a legitimate reason for rejecting uh, the methodology. Um, so, I take your point though. Um, they don't focus on the regulation the way they did in the other case on which they rely. And they don't quite make the specific argument uh, that we're suggesting. So is your position then that even though in making an argument, FERC has cited the relevant regulation, 
your argument is more than it needs to do more than put it in a footnote. Your argument is even were it in the body of the petition, there has to be some explanation of how this regulation is demanding a FERC more than what it did. I think that's right, Your Honor. I mean, I do think it's, it's, it's interesting that it's only in a footnote, but in addition, they're not make, there are no words in that, in that paragraph of the rehearing request that say, FERC, we recognize that you've given these reasons, we recognize you've been upheld, but nonetheless, this regulation compels you to do something different. I, I don't see those words. I see a passing reference to their assertion that it's generally accepted. I don't see the separate legal argument. And it, which, you would, mean, which Mr. Maxwell, you would have expected them to make after the long history of them saying similar things and FERC responding in the way that it had and this court upholding it. So if we are now in a world of a new argument about the regulation, I would think that we would have expected to see in the text, this is a new argument, please focus on it. Here's what we're saying. <laughs> Precisely, because otherwise, I mean, if the court has already upheld the same reasons that are being articulated here, one, you know, where's the argument going? Uh, and, and I mean, it's it's a hundred and forty something page rehearing request with four hundred plus footnotes. You know, I, I do think it's important to have the reasonable burden on the commission. And what what does a rehearing order look like if this kind of glancing uh, reference is enough to preserve for appeal? Then obviously the commission is going to need to respond to all such glancing references. Well, the commission's EAs are no longer twenty five pages long. No, they are not. But but there has also been pressure on the commission, and yeah. I mean the commission can speak to this to, to, to move more quickly on rehearing orders uh, in response to this court's on uh, banc decision in sure. August defense. So I do think there. I mean, there ha there has to be some. There is value in 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 the court's traditional view that this is an argument. Arguments need to be raised with particularity, and that that's a jurisdictional requirement under this court's cases. Can you quickly do downstream consequences before your time runs out? Yes, and I think I may be out already, but I'm, I'd be happy to. Um, I, I would urge the court, I, I know there were a number of important and, and perhaps broader questions raised about downstream, but we have a record here, and we have specific arguments that were raised. And I understand the, the argument raised in the blue brief to be FERC should have quantified downstream emissions from burning gas at the Calpine plant, which is off something called the Parkway Lateral. Uh, and what FERC said in response to that well, they asked us, uh, you know, do you have a contract? W what's your contract on Zone South? And we said, well, it's actually a contract with a shipper going to an interconnection with a, a, another interstate pipeline system. We did not have a, a contract with Calpine, uh, the, the Calpine plants going off the Parkway lateral. To this day, we do not have a contract with Calpine going off the Parkway uh, lateral. And we said, no, the, the gas is going into the broader interstate pipeline system. So I think if Burkhead is, is the law, and in Burkhead, the, the court said they rejected both arguments from left and right. They said Sable Trail is not limited to its facts, but also Sable Trail doesn't mean that it is always an indirect effect. And here I would, I would propose that when you have a project that is largely interconnecting the existing pipeline grid, providing optionality uh, and you know, other pathways for gas, this is sort of the extreme case where it is hardest to make a prediction because all you know is it's some incremental capacity that's going into the broader grid. And, and I understand the instinct that's been articulated that the commission needs to do something and, and make reasonable inferences. But I, I do think it's important to understand that FERC created a, a highly liquid market for this transportation capacity. And it is released, it is purchased by some shippers, it is released when they don't need it. And that's why it works well. And so, you know, the, it, it, it could be that the gas is going to replace, be a more reliable substitute for gas being used by a plant. That's what we know would, would have been true for Calpine had they ever bought service from us. They already had gas, but this would have been an alternate source. That's sort of like the power plants in the North. Or it could be like the Kimberly Clark plant where we know this gas was used to demolish a coal fired, uh, a waste coal fired plant. So that's, that's on net ameliorative. And I think if you read a, the fairest reading of Sable Trail and Burkhead is that the commission can and has to make judgments in light of the nature 
of this market. I mean, I understand the instinct, but the, the notion that you can uh, have a tracer or something, it, I think it's like, where is a particular electron going to go in the power grid? The whole point and, and value and redundancy and strength of this network is that it is highly liquid. Well, I um, think that's very helpful, actually, uh, Mr. Uh, Marwell. Thank, thank, thank you. you, Your Honor. C could I briefly address the status of the project? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the zone north, which is the portion of the project which replaced existing service to two power plants that have no backup source of gas, has been in service since day one. That, that, that's where we just bought the asset, the existing pipeline that has been in the ground since the 1970s. The zone south facilities remain under construction. There's been a little bit of slippage in some of them, but they are actively under construction. Some of them will be ready for service later this year, November, December. Others are going to slip a little bit. But those facilities, as we said in our brief, um, are, are needed. And in fact, as the commission contemplated in its order, uh, Adelphi has continued to seek uh, shippers, you know, customers, and the pipeline today is 98% subscribed. So we've had additional uh, evidence of need. So I'm, I'd be happy to answer questions about upstream or anything else, but I, so I would this heard- is, I'm sorry. So the, the, that last set of comments was about remanding without vacater as opposed to with, is that um, what you were addressing, are you trying to talk about mootness sort of, or? Oh, uh, no, I wasn't making a mootness suggestion, Your Honor. I think okay. the court's cases uh, would, would, would weigh against us on mootness. Uh, no, I, I was uh, hoping that you don't get to remand without vacator, uh, but recognizing that there's been some vigorous discussion, uh, I just wanted to emphasize, you know, this is not a case, I mean, this is an unusual case in some respects because the pipe has been in the ground since the 1970s. So I know the court has addressed the, circumstances where you might vacate, there's concern about sort of rushed construct and do the environmental review later. I would suggest that's not at all what's happening here. And I would just urge that the consequences of vacator are, are, would be very severe here, particularly for the Northern uh, segment where there's been no environmental effects at all. It's just a paper, you know, we bought it from the other uh, owner and we've continued exactly the same service that these power plants have been taking. So. We certainly think you should deny the petitions, but if you were to remand on anything, uh, particularly because the court remanded without vacater in Vecinos, where the same uh, CEQ regulation was at issue, uh, this seems like a substantially stronger case for application of that doctrine. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. So, counsel for Delaware River Keepers, uh, you have a couple of minutes on rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'd just like to emphasize, um, as Mr. Marwell pointed out, the, the citation at JA0795, where we did raise the point on rehearing that, uh, that FERC was required to use social cost of carbon because it's generally accepted in the scientific community. Uh, I think, you know, regardless of whether it's in a footnote or not, it's a citation to a regulation that they're required to follow. And that regulation specifically says that the well, agencies count, count, evaluate- count. Help me out then. I mean, what I found particularly helpful, Mr. Marwell's saying essentially, we're in a changed energy world. Um, Congress authorized, these are my words, not his, but Congress authorized FERC um, to do precisely what it's done here. And now we have this very liquid and expansive market uh, that ultimately is to benefit the consumer through reliable supply at reasonable cost. And in that context, the requirement that the objection be specifically stated in a petition for rehearing seems to me to have particular significance. What's your response to that? Uh, well, our response is that we, we believe we sufficiently raised that objection here. We, we specifically stated that it's generally accepted in the scientific community, referred to the regulation, which says that it, the agency needs to use generally accepted methods. Uh, we pointed out how cost monetization is appropriate, where there's alternative modes that aren't, that can't be used. Uh, Ms. You know, Ms. We're basically Manahan, saying. Ms. Manahan, you, you might have something in terms of your suggestion that that was enough to preserve the argument that FERC had to do it. If we all agree that the regulation that you're pointing to is applicable in this circumstance. This takes us all the way back to Judge Silberman's very first question, which is given that there is not 
universal acceptance that the regulation that you cited applies in the EA context, then you're just citing to that regulation, it seems to me, does not go far enough to make the point in and of itself that FERC had to do it in this context. This, this citation could very well mean, look, you might have had to do it in EIS world, see, because it's generally scientifically whatever. And in this context, we are just pointing to that to show you that this is a really good tool. Other courts have done it. If you had picked EIS, you probably would have had to do it. But we understand you're in EI, EA world and our corpus of arguments are no different than what we have been saying all along um, and that you've responded to all along, which is just, we really think this is great and you should do it. I feel like you needed to say more, at least at the threshold of this regulation applies to this circumstance. And as a result, you don't have a choice. And I don't see that in this document. And you, Mr. Fish says you point to maybe saying that somewhere else, but do you concede that this would be the relevant document that we need to look for to determine whether or not you've preserved this issue? Yeah, yes, Your Honor, this is the relevant document. The and 795 is the, is the place. 795 is where you say you've preserved this issue. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, but uh, overall, the, essentially when it comes to downstream emissions, uh, there was some discussion, there was extensive discussion with Mr. Fish on, on downstream emissions. Um, and whether the 97% figure and, uh, is sufficient to essentially estimate the amount of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, what this court says in Burkhead is it does not contradict that. What this court says in Burkhead is that it's not categorically reasonably foreseeable in every circumstance that all capacity on a pipeline is going to be, uh, is going to be combusted. Well, and that's true um, in the-, in the Rogers, please. She'll have to call you back. I'm sorry. Uh, that is true in, in the context where there is information in the record that the gas is going to be used for another purpose. For example, if there was information in the record that some of the capacity was going to a chemical plant, we would concede that it's not categorically reasonably foreseeable that that portion of gas is going to be combusted. But when you have a statistic such as 97%, I think that it, then you can say it is reasonably foreseeable that the gas that you cannot identify a specific end use for is going to be combusted. And finally, the, the essential issue here is that the public needs FERC to understand exactly how these projects are needed, why this gas needs to be transported, why this gas needs to be combusted to bring necessary gas to the public, especially in the context of climate change, one of the most pressing issues of our time uh, and when this industry, you know, combusts fossil fuels, we need to understand that these projects are needed. So some of these questions about where the gas is coming from and where the gas is going to is very pertinent. And, you know, even sometimes in the, in the context of when pipelines are describing their projects, they'll say, hey, we're trying to bring gas from this shale region to this market. And, you know, we, we as the public, we expect FERC to understand those dynamics and to tell us exactly how they're going to impact the public. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. All right. Uh, Council for Petitioner West Rockies Township, Mr. Blasey. I, I to, to, told this honorable court uh, that I would provide a case citation on the, of the 40 acre principle that the industry believes is present. So I just realized I forgot or didn't. So that was Delaware Riverkeeper versus the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It's found at the 869 Fed 3rd 148 in 2017. It's a third circuit. And let me just quote what they say. So this goes back to this presumption that's broadly held that compressor stations, which are industrial facilities, which didn't in any level pre-exist at Quakertown, um, need more space. So Tennessee's gases application on October 9, 2015, 
Tennessee Gas submitted an application to FERC for approval of the Orion project. Its, op its application included an environmental report which discussed and rejected compression alternatives. Tennessee Gas explained that building compressor stations would require Tennessee Gas, quote, to obtain approximately 40 acres per site, per in, total of 80 acres, close per in, close quotation. And it goes on. So this is the Mr. third Lacey. circuit reporting on this. This is another, yeah. if I'm, is another example of what is perceived as needed to build a safe station. And here we're told 1.5 acres is okay, trust us. And that we think is inadequate, completely inadequate. I'm sorry, Your Honor, I kept talking. I've got some more things to say, but what was your question? No, no, it's all right. I, I, I just wanted to highlight um, Mr. Fish's point that uh, FERC believes its obligation is to consider and discuss the alternatives. You seem to be suggesting with that case that they need to discuss the alternatives in a certain way, that they need to specifically uh, address the uh, inadequacies of the uh, other places, the other alternatives. And I'm kind of wondering where that level of duty comes from. You, do we have cases that suggest that in their discussion of the alternatives, or is there a regulation that says we have to lay out exactly what we found to be problematic with the other places? I, I don't, and I guess I would look for that um, and, and ask permission and obviously expect responses from others if you, you wanted us to do that. I can't off the top of my head. My perception of the environmental assessment process has always been that you look for these issues and if something broader is lurking, that's what triggers. You've got to use your judgment as the administrative agency to seek more. And what, what we have been saying is what is in front of them as fact leads you to say, this, this, we are out of sync with practice and fact, and we need to do more. Now, as I said, it, now more could be, and this is FERC's authority, and my client may say, oh, keep your mouth shut on this. But FERC could have said, oh, 20 or 25 acres here, it can be obtained. There's some large properties, acquire a few of them. We can make a safe site here. We want it here. And we probably would have very little reason to say you really need to consider or take the other alternative. The reason we say the other alternative was given short shrift was that it already was sized to what appears to be industry practice and they just dismiss it. Oh, don't need to do it. That's what was so bothersome about that. Now, yes, in an EIS process, it clearly the alternatives would have been given greater consideration, all of the implications. I, I can look for a case if this course wants and we'll try to find it very quickly that talks about the interface between EA and EIS on an issue like this and see if we can be helpful uh, to All you right. there. Any other argument? I just have one last kind of set of information to give. But again, Judge Silverman had asked what were the, or, or maybe it was you, Judge Jackson, where we had raised these issues. And they're in the, I call them the R references because there are many pages. One was R890. The second time the township raised was the R920. And finally, R939 was the rehearing petition um, that we offered. So our uh, request to this court is to make sure that the reason we want to remand or, um, to the agency is that it de develops and proposes for the public a safe project that people can have confidence in. And we think it is lacking at this point, given the decision that's been made. All right. Thank you, Thank you all. We'll take the case under advisement. This honorable court is now adjourned until Thursday, September 30th at 9.30 a.m.